alopecia areata, an autoimmune disease that leads to hair loss, was brought to center stage at the Oscars when actor Will Smith slapped comedian Chris Rock after he made a joke about Smith's wife, Jada Pinkett Smith, who suffers from the condition. We wanted to dig deeper into alopecia and what life is like for those who deal with it every day. The NewsHour's Nicole Ellis recently spoke to a leading expert to learn more about what we know and don't know about the autoimmune disorder. But first, we hear from people across the country who live with the disease. My name is Ebony Jean. To date, I have lived with alopecia for 27 years now. My name is Simon Rubenstein. I've had alopecia now for nearly two decades. I was first diagnosed when I was eight years old. I found hair clumps in my bed. I found bald spots. I wasn't really sure what to do. My name is Deirdre Nero, and I turned 45 this year, and I started to have patchy alopecia when I was 21 years old. So it's been over half of my life now. Um, so this is a wig that I wear, so I'm going to take it off so you can see what my alopecia looks like. My name is Bob Flint. I was three and a half when I was diagnosed with the disease. And frankly, I don't remember. My folks, I'm sure, told me, but that's how I found, that's how I found out. My name is Janelle Massey, and my daughter's name is Kayla Massey. Kayla has been living with alopecia since she was around four years old. She's now 10, so six years. Growing up dealing with hair loss, a lot of people mistreated me for my appearance because they had asked so many questions regarding my condition and they made me feel less than because I know dealing with hair, um, being a woman, you know, a lot of people use that as a way of defining our beauty. You know, it was very difficult. You know, children can be very mean, very hard on, you know, the playground or in the cafeteria. You know, I experienced people, you know, ripping my hats off or, you know, just staring at me. Didn't know a single other person in the world that had alopecia. I thought I was the only one on earth that was dealing with this, or at least it felt like that, even though I knew intellectually, I knew that that wasn't true. I felt very alone um, and had a hard time dealing with it. So I, I, I hit it a lot. For many years, I was caught off guard and I was very emotional. So we were constantly trying to make sure that we weren't projecting feelings onto our children who were really young and not experiencing um, some of those emotions that older teenagers and young, you know, adults um, go through with the grief and the loss um, and the emotional uh, toll that grief takes. The, the biggest issue is we're regular people. We don't have hair, but that doesn't change us. That doesn't make us slower or faster. It's just hair. Until you start picking on me as a kid or laughing at me or pointing me out in a crowd. And that's where it hurts. It's, it's, in, it's in the head. It's clearly in the head. It's a psychological impact of the disease more than anything else. I would like for people to take away the fact that hair does not define any of us and alopecia may not be life threatening, but it is life altering. It affects a person's livelihood as well as their mental health. So it's just time for everyone to show a little more respect for the alopecia community and to educate themselves more on the condition and how they can support us. I'm an attorney. I'm an immigration attorney in Miami and I have my own law firm and I've had colleagues ask me after they saw a picture of me. Uh, without hair, uh, if I would be able to handle the case or not, because I was sick. It's draining and exhausting to have to constantly be um, dealing with, with it all the time. And so, you know, just to be kind to people and maybe a little bit more understanding. Empathy is different than sympathy and um, the power of pity, but your encouragement and your validation that we do have sad days and we do have happy days, but we're going to be there nevertheless, you know, that we're, we're still blessed. For a closer look at alopecia and the different ways that the disease can affect people, I'm joined by Dr. Brett King. He's an associate professor of dermatology at Yale University's School of Medicine. Dr. King, for those who've never heard of alopecia, what exactly is it and what do we know about who it impacts? Yeah, so it's an important question. Alopecia just refers to hair loss, and that means hair loss broadly. So that includes male pattern hair loss, female pattern hair loss, alopecia areata, and then other forms of hair loss. 
what we have had uh, a lot of attention to in the media recently is the form of hair loss called alopecia areata, which is an autoimmune form of hair loss that affects people of all ages, uh, all races, uh, though it typically occurs for the first time in the first, uh, say, 40 or 50 years of life. But again, it's an autoimmune form of hair loss, so, so distinctly different than, say, male pattern hair loss. So you mentioned alopecia areata, but are there different types or what are the different types of alopecia? Yeah, so alopecia areata most commonly is uh, characterized by a spot or a few spots of hair loss. And these can be the size of a nickel. These could be the size of a half dollar. They are often round or oval shaped patches of hair loss, typically involving the scalp, but they can involve an eyebrow, the eyelashes, the beard area in men. And again, this is the most common presentation of alopecia areata. Of course, there can be more severe presentations as well, where people lose 50% or 80% or 100% of their scalp hair. The folks with the most severe presentations are often said to have alopecia totalis or alopecia universalis, but again, it's all alopecia areata. How does this disease progress? What does it do to your body? And is there a treatment for it? Again, going back to the most typical presentation, that is somebody who develops a spot or a few spots of hair loss, this, this will be what the majority of people ever have with alopecia areata. One of the menacing things about this disease, though, is that it's very unpredictable. And so we don't know who is going to be the person that in three weeks, three months, or three years, those two spots are going to turn into complete scalp hair loss or complete scalp hair loss in addition to loss of eyebrows and eyelashes. And it's that unpredictability which makes, or is part of what makes the disease so difficult to deal with. What's really exciting, getting to your question of are there treatments, what's really exciting is that up until recently, there was not thought to be a very good treatment for people who have severe alopecia areata, people who have lost 50% or 80% or 100% of their scalp hair. One of the really exciting developments is just two weeks ago, a paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine showing a new medicine called baricitinib that grows hair in up to 40% of people with the most severe form of alopecia areata. And so indeed, what was once uh, something that was thought to be untreatable, we're completely changing that paradigm. And indeed, there's hope uh, for the future for people with this disease. While there is some progress, there are still many people who experience alopecia or hair loss in severe forms. What do we know about the impact this disease can have on the mental health of people who are diagnosed with it? Uh, it's such an important um, issue to address. Alopecia areata is very often a devastating disease to suffer from. I think all you have to do is understand what it would, or try to imagine, rather, what it would be like to wake up to all of your hair on your pillowcase. It's confusing at the very least, and again, wildly devastating to just imagine what that feels like. Your identity can be erased in a moment. People with alopecia areata or severe alopecia areata are often thought to be sick, right? This is an appearance that is easily mistaken for somebody with cancer undergoing chemotherapy. And so the impact of this disease on uh, quality of life, on personal identity, on cultural identity uh, is tremendous. And so it really highlights why we need to keep pushing uh, to make this disease better and to find effective treatments. Dr. Brett King, Associate Professor of Dermatology at Yale University School of Medicine. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity.